We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings. This is the Anadromist, Burn Power, coming to you from a sunny day near the end of summer in mid-September here in Tbilisi, Georgia. And if you don't know where that is, you should look it up on a map. Today what we're going to do is we are going to continue our series on how we got here. This will be Episode 7, another long one. Uh, they're all going to be long from here. Uh, you got off early in the beginning of the series. But this is going to be about the superficial aspects of the 1980s, the illusions of the 1980s. One of the big questions I've been asking for quite a while, and it's been at least, what, when did I first start to notice, I mean, 80s revival has been around for ages, and 80s nostalgia has been around, it seems, almost as long as since the 80s. There was a time in the 90s when there was no 80s nostalgia, but there has been this trend ever since the beginning of the 21st century to go back to the 1980s. I think maybe September 11th really did this. Uh, the 90s were a very strange decade, and then the aughts were also, uh, they had their fears, a lot of fears after September 11th. And this last decade has also been a strange one at that. So I think there's a tendency to look back at the 1980s as in a certain way. Um, it's interesting that the nostalgia for the 1980s is far greater than the nostalgia for the 1970s or the 1990s or the aughts. People tend to look at the 1980s as some, some sort of, well, uh, I don't know. There was a recent episode of Black Mirror where they had uh, these a couple of women you know, who were, I won't go into the whole episode, but it ends essentially with them living in a simulated 1980s forever. So the 1980s is almost like heaven. Let me show you a clip of that. <laughs> Now, I lived through the 1980s, and this is what I can tell you. And I was kind of there at the heart of it. I lived in New York City through the entire 80s. There were a couple of months at the beginning that I wasn't there. But basically, uh, from October 1980 all the way through to the end, I was there. And I saw all the trends come and go. And this is what I can tell you with great honesty and depth. It was a boring pit of a decade. It was the worst decade Ever. And it's not that I suffered any particular traumas in that decade, you know, apart from the stuff you normally go through of relationships and trying to find jobs and all this sort of stuff. But I mean, there was no big thing in my life, which would, I mean, the 90s had some greater traumas than for me than the 1980s and the 1970s had more traumas for me than the 1980s and you know all along the way uh you know it seemed but why have so many people chosen to you know they they joke about the big hair they talk about you know it i mean it's almost like they look at it as this last innocent period because it wasn't really innocent at all uh they look at it i mean it couldn't be innocent We'd just gone through the 70s. Everyone was still living in the, the the mindset of sex and drugs 
and the failures of rock and roll, the failures of all those things. Everyone was still living through it. Um, I think what the 1980s did, well, it created the world we're now living in. And that is to say it set the template. What it did was it took the vast changes of the 1970s and 60s and then commercialized them into forms we could all hold on to and laugh about. Now, maybe that to you sounds great. Enjoy your 80s nostalgia. If you're here for 80s nostalgia, uh, all I can tell you is abandon hope, all ye who enter. <laughs> it's Dante's sign over Inferno. Because by the time I'm done with this episode and the next episode, and by the way, you should watch the last episode on the beginning of the Culture Wars, 1980s isn't going to seem like a nice time at all. Uh, musically, I would give anything not to relive the 1980s. I don't know why people like the music of the 1980s. I mean, yeah, I do, but I don't. Um, <sighs> no, it was the decade that created the culture war, which we are now seeing the bitter fruits of. So, yeah, I don't really like the 1980s. I wish the 1970s had resolved more questions. I mean, that's how it always is. Questions are set up by different decades and they are not resolved and yet life goes on and these things are go on and on and on. Now, I've started this whole How We Got Here series um, beginning with World War II. Now, obviously, World War II didn't come out of nowhere and maybe someday I'll go back and pick up some of the threads of... Uh, how we got to World War II, because obviously some of those questions have not been answered, and the very fact that there are Marxists, I mean, bona fide, genuine Marxists with hammers and sickles, running around protesting on the streets of cities, it says something wasn't learned during the <laughs> Cold War, during the than the 20th century, that we would still have these issues. So World War II came, and its aftermath in the 1940s. And I think the mood of the times was simply, we've survived. And yet there was a great deal of psychic damage from that war. Any, any war that would have caused about 70 million deaths worldwide you'd think would leave a little damage. I mean, people talk about, you know, the psychic damage from one person getting shot on the streets of a city in America and how that blows up. 70 million people died in World War II. Yeah, that left some huge crater-like psychic damage that we are all still living under that shadow. I mean, that, that was such a big shadow that we are still under it. Um... The 1950s was more about conformity, um, the need to get back to normality, the, the need to stay safe, the need to relax, uh, trying to forget the Great Depression, trying to forget that war, just get back to normal. Uh, it was also the rise through the civil rights movement and the beat generation, among other things, of a let's call it an alternative conscience. Later, we might use the term alternative consciousness when we get to the 60s. The 60s was a period of philosophical questioning, really. I mean, whether it's the, the art house movies and foreign movies, whether it's the, uh, you know, all the unanswered questions left by the damaged vets of World War II, uh, you know, it's just like they told their children, you should follow the Ten Commandments. You should follow the Bible. But they didn't really read the Bible. They didn't really follow the Ten Commandments. They were hypocrites in the true sense of the word, of saying you should do one thing and then doing another. You could say that the... the main question of the 1960s was... What is truth? And it wasn't answered. The tables were overturned. 
but it wasn't answered. There was a huge crater in the middle of civilization, but it wasn't answered. I mean, there are people who think, yeah, we started to find the answers then. And I think those people are kind of deluded. Um, yeah, important questions were asked, but bad answers were given. And those bad answers have left us where we are today. <sighs> the 70s. Tom Wolfe called it the me decade. The discovery of selfishness. Who am I was the big question. Because we couldn't answer the big questions. What, what is life? You know, some people tried to do it through psychedelics and such. But it didn't answer the question. It only posed the question. And some people say, well, that's all you need is to pose the question. I'm saying, like, you know, if you don't have some basic answers, you're in deep trouble. And in the 70s, people got less interested in the big questions and more interested in the question of how do I live? How do I stay healthy? You know, how do I, you know, take care of my psychological states? Do I need therapy? These kinds of questions. Maybe I shouldn't smoke so much. Maybe I should, you know, questions of health, questions of, of personal psychology. That's when they started in the 1970s. That became the popular uh, culture. And essentially, you could say the baby boom generation got completely selfish and also was unhinged because it was also the, I mean, uh, high water mark of depravity. I mean, we often say, well, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. I'd like to put you down on, say, I don't know, 42nd Street and 8th Avenue in New York City in 1979. And you tell me. That's all I'd like to tell you. Or go watch Taxi Driver. So the 80s became more about economics. How do I keep going? We, we've discovered we couldn't uh, resolve the traumas of the war. We couldn't uh, just simply be conformist. So we asked big questions as a culture. And that failed because we, uh, well, we used the wrong answers. We used radical politics. We used uh, anger. We used uh, naivete through sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It failed. It entered. We entered into a despairing period in the 1970s, a very dark period, and yet one full of open questions still, questions that disappeared after that period. But when we came to the 80s, the main question was, how do I keep myself going financially? How do I keep, you know, if I, how do I keep the gears lubricated? You know, we don't know how the machine works, but it's still working. So how do we keep the gears lubricated? A lot of people think it was a conservative decade. Uh, I often hear this thing where, you know, uh, uh, you know, all those horror films where they were killing children uh, who just after they had sex. That was like a conservative thing to say sex was naughty, <laughs> to which I laugh and I go like, guys, they're showing you nude bodies on the screen writhing. Do you think those people were really conservatives? <laughs> you know, no, they had another thing in their mind. How do I make money? <laughs> That's what really motivated them. You could call that a conservative uh, thing if you wish, but I think it just became a societal global affair at that point. Ronald Reagan was elected. Ronald Reagan was really a man of the 1950s. That is to say, the, the vision he had from, for America was essentially the same thing that was going on in Eisenhower's uh, decade. Which is to say, it was not fit for the 1980s. And there was much that Ronald Reagan did not understand about the 1980s. He was a cold warrior. And I would say, we probably needed one. And he went way overboard in places like Latin America. I'm not going to discuss politics here. I'm more interested in the culture of how we got here. But anyway, the big deal was that the Cold War continued through... Well, 60s, 70s, 80s, we were no longer in Vietnam. We were no longer fighting active wars. We were engaged in proxy wars all over the place uh, with our advisors. Um, but after the beginning of the decade in which there was a recession, uh, between, say, 82 and 87, the economy was booming. And uh, it stopped with Black Monday in October 19th, 1987. 
And that's when there was one of the hugest stock market crashes in history at that point. Now, it didn't end up leading to a global recession. I mean, things were a little tight for a year or two, but essentially things rebounded almost immediately. And a lot of people look back at the 80s and they remember this philosophy. They think, they often think somebody like maybe Ronald Reagan said this or something, that greed is good. Well, Ronald Reagan didn't say this. This was from Oliver Stone's movie, Wall Street, in which he has Michael Douglas's character, Gordon Gecko, head of, uh, you know, big money, we'll call it, uh, big business, Wall Street investing stuff, saying basically that greed is good. In fact, let's watch a clip of that right now. That greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. And of course, many people are going to immediately think of one of the 80s most prominent members, Donald Trump, who is, in a sense, an 80s person, much in the way that Ronald Reagan was a 50s person. And he has brought his 80s philosophy in a mutated way into the 21st century, into the last part of the teens of the 20th century. Trump, I'm not going to talk about Trump at this point at all, uh, except to say that I don't think he was quite the Gordon Gecko character, but certainly there are a lot of comparisons. Trump did do something that was kind of interesting, uh, among the many things, as he built the Trump Tower, which was a place for very wealthy people to live way up in the tower of the city. And this started a uh, move of rich, very rich people back into the cities. Uh, not that Trump was the only factor. Reagan's economy was certainly a factor um, the fact that people had learned to, we now use the word monetize, uh, incentivize was probably the word they used at the time. Uh, so many uh, industrial, commercial enterprises at the time. And so New York became seen. When I moved there in 1980, rents were just starting to get pretty high. I couldn't quite afford a good place. So, I, you know, I was living... You know, I, well, I went after a year in uh, the West Village. I ended up in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, right near Williamsburg. That place would be now very hip. There were absolutely no cool people in Brooklyn at that point, at that part of Brooklyn. Later, it became something. Um, but the important thing is that Trump's building was kind of an early postmodern piece of architecture. Uh, you, and postmodern architecture, in a way, you could look at the 1980s as the beginning of postmodern culture. What do I mean? I'm not talking about postmodern philosophy, and there's many people who need to learn the difference between postmodern philosophy and postmodern culture. They are two different but related things. Postmodern culture features things like irony, appropriation, deconstruction which is also something you find in postmodern philosophy. But they didn't necessarily get it from each other. Postmodern uh, art, for instance, goes back to people like Andy Warhol or Roy Lichtenstein, uh, that, that you get this uh, sense of borrowing from other things. Uh, uh, Lichtenstein's borrowing from uh, comic books for his art. Uh, Andy Warhol borrowing from images of Marilyn Monroe or Elvis Presley for his art. That's very definitely a postmodern trend. But he was early. They were early on the scene. And people hadn't named it as such. It was still, in a sense, a part of, of modernism. But what was happening is that there was a new trend, and you could start to see it in architecture in the 1980s. For instance, Philip Johnson, a very important architect from the period, built a place called the PPG 
well, it was the, at the PPG place, uh, 1983. Check out this building. And he did this with John Berge. And uh, check out this building. It has castle crenellations on top. Why? Where are there soldiers looking, you know, uh, and, you know where the, where the uh, archers up on top ready to shoot down the invaders? No. It was made of glass. Nobody's coming to invade that building. Not until 2020 anyway, probably. But the point is, is that, it, no, that was a quote. Postmodern culture was all about the quote. If postmodern philosophy questions meta-narrative, postmodern uh, art and culture is ironic about the meanings of, the, of, of art. So that anything can be quoted, deconstructed, inverted, turned inside out, and made to say whatever you want. And in that way, they are related. Teen Disney Building, 1986. This is by Michael Graves. Notice especially the statuary on the building. Cute Disney creatures. That's totally post Modern. Now, they're getting it from, there was a style in the 1950s and 60s, particularly in places like Los Angeles, where they would make, you know, buildings in the shapes of hats or dinosaurs or whatever. And they called that googie, looking back on it. But th those people were doing it because almost like commercial venues. You know, it's just like, oh, we sell uh, Mexican food, so we'll build uh, a building like a sombrero. But postmodern architecture builds buildings with like a Sheridan chair uh, on top. You know, it's just like it's it quotes and then it gives you a wink. All postmodern uh, culture is like that. It has that sense of irony. We'll see that more as we go. Now, during this period in New York City, graffiti was really important. And it was uh, hotly debated. You know, uh, I remember Ed Koch once said, I can't tell you if it's art, but I can certainly tell you it's a crime. Uh, graffiti uh, was there, I think, as an expression of people whose lives had been blighted, particularly in the South Bronx and such. By the time I came to New York in 1980, we were in the middle of the beginnings of the graffiti culture. They were borrowing from people like Von Baudet, the comic book artist who's big balloony kind of scripts and other kinds of, well, they weren't fonts, but, you know, uh, calli calli calligraphics, yes. Um, but coming out of this scene was also, there were what I call interlopers from the art world. One of them was Keith Herring who would go around the subways of New York and would find old, uh, you know, these little uh, billboard uh, squares or rectangles that they had, and he would colonize one and then paint on it his squiggly little figures. A lot of people love Keith Haring's art. It's totally ironic and totally postmodern, and I don't find much in it at all. It was sad when he passed away of AIDS, but I was never a fan of that kind of art because I looked at it and I said to myself, it's, you know, the meaning, yeah, he can use, he can make propaganda statements about it. He certainly did that. But the point of the matter is this. There was no depth to it. And that is what, one of the things that postmodernism does, is it tends to cut off the, the depth component. Not always. I think the films of David Lynch are very postmodern, and yet there's a lot going on there. But uh, I think I've talked about David Lynch a little before, and maybe next time I'll talk about him a bit more. Uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, another uh, tragic victim, not of AIDS, but of the 1980s, uh, was of Haitian uh, immigrant stock, and he also traveled in some of these uh, graffiti circles and uh, street art circles in the early 1980s. His work uh, also harkens back to Haitian voodoo art, which is actually really fascinating. And I think that's what gives it its strength. 
But I think the more he went along, the more his work... Well, here's the problem. You take this this wildly uh, dark, uh, messy art, which he's quoting from the voodoo art. He's quoting from street art. He's quoting from things. It is postmodern. Like I said, there is more depth here in this one. But it's now being put in bracketed on white walls and galleries. And since his death has been selling for millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. Um, it is strange. It is sad. Uh, the way, uh, who was it? Eric Bogosian once said, uh, you know, back in the day, the, uh, the great white hunters used to go to Africa and they would shoot a rhino or a, an elephant and then they would have the head or the body stuffed and they would put the head on their walls and it was a sign saying well among other things i have a lot of money but it also said i own this and he said that's what's happened to art and he said this at the end of the 1980s in one of his performance pieces that's what's happened to art it's now owned by the corporations and the rich people of America. I mean, in a sense, you could say it's always been owned by the rich people and other patrons like the church in the past. But something had changed now, whereas now it was like we've decapitated the artist and there he is or she is on the walls. A photo of uh, Andy Warhol and Basquiat, both of whom would be dead by the end of the 1980s. Very symbolic. And Warhol gets me in mind of conceptual art from the 1980s. Here, here's a conceptual piece. And that's all there is to it. There is nothing more to this conceptual work than basically saying it's a conceptual piece. And uh, as I think I mentioned this before, I once walked into a gallery where nothing was there. I looked around, everything just looked neat. Nothing was going to be happening. Nothing was happening. But I looked around and I said, oh, this is a day without art, isn't it? It's a conceptual gallery installation. And they said, yes. And I was just like, okay, get me out of here. So, but postmodernists uh, started to become very important. Here's some of the work of Eric Fischel. Eric Fischel was another important gallery artist in New York City who did a lot of paintings of suburban scenes. But you'll notice, these aren't like happy suburban scenes. This is, there's something wrong with the suburbs. Of course, people living in the cities would have to feel there's something wrong with the suburbs. Although today I find it's starting to feel the other way, that people are starting to say, hey, those suburbs are great, and who wants to live in the city anymore? We've now seen the great reversal of what had been happening in the 1980s, where people were moving to the cities, raising the prices, gentrifying. Now we're seeing people fleeing the cities. I think over 500,000 people have fled New York. That was a statistic I got from two months ago, so who knows how many more have fled since then. And I'm so glad I'm no longer living in New York City. But uh, Julian Schnabel, very important artist, did a movie on uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, which I do recommend the movie. It's helpful, if not entirely accurate. And I think that Schnabel is interesting. He had a whole technique where he would uh, take plates and bits of porcelain and pottery and actually integrate them into his paintings, which would make them tremendously heavy. I moved a couple of them at one point. I, I actually spent about uh, three years in New York City as an art mover at the end of the decade. I remember I was working when we found out Andy Warhol died, and we had huge conversation about what his meaning was. And uh, you couldn't be a part of this art moving job without having some connection to the arts. And I, So it was really fascinating conversations. Some of the other drivers were all... You know, you know, Andy Warhol was great. Andy Warhol did this, and I said, "Yeah, but what about this? And what about that?" And and I love those kind of, kind of conversations. But um, yeah, these things were an absolute, <laughs> shall I say, it, bitch to move. Uh, 
Yeah, because they were so heavy. <laughs> and But it wasn't just the fact that he was putting broken plates into his art. It's the fact that, again, there's a lot of quotations. There were all sorts of new styles. This was neo-abstraction, but there was neo-geo and neo-op art and all this other stuff. All these neo-movements were all postmodern. That is to say, they were quotes from earlier movements. But I do, I do like Schnabel's work. I think he's one of the better uh, painters, uh, or, or is this mud layers, <laughs> brick layers, of the uh, 1980s. Uh, I also really appreciate the work of the German Anselm Kiefer from this period. And I think if I was going to say who is the greatest artist from this period, it's Anselm Kiefer. And I don't think I'd even really call him postmodern. I mean, his work has a definite anguish. There's this mound of, of it just feels like this deathly mound. Uh, to me, it's, it's his generation dealing with the memories of what had happened to Germany uh, when he was younger. So to me, that's in a slightly different category. It's, there's a whole German line of, of art here, but I think Anselm Kiefer is very important. Cindy Sherman, another New York artist uh, who was, at least she showed in New York all the time. Most of these artists would, once they got the chance, they would leave. They'd go to upstate New York or to other places like Pennsylvania where they could drift into the city uh, when they needed to. But Cindy Sherman uh, took a lot of self-portraits. In a sense, you could say she was obsessed with the selfie way before anyone else. However... Cindy Sherman's selfies are not like your selfies. And this is what makes Cindy Sherman so interesting. I think her entire career has been nothing but portraits of herself. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this. Maybe she did a couple of other things that weren't. But everything I've ever seen was Cindy Sherman in some way or another being present in her own photos. So she did a series of of deaths of her own deaths of of victims of crime for instance look closely at this see if you can find cindy sherman you don't see her wait a second what's that oh that's cindy sherman <laughs> dead reflected in the glasses uh you know very interesting Where's the postmodern part of this? Well, I think it is the fact that she's obsessed with herself is very postmodern. I think anytime anyone takes a selfie these days, they are engaged in a hyper postmodern act. It is the appropriation of the self for deconstruction. So when you put yourself on Instagram in a certain way, you're basically saying, I'm not really this person. But here's what I'm presenting. Um, and I think in a way our, our postmodern art has gone beyond postmodern into the almost techno-pagan, but that's something else I'm thinking about. Okay, finally we'll end up with the most successful artist from the period, Jeff Koons, who did things like uh, absolute kitschy, statues of Michael Jackson and his pet monkey. Uh, let me do the, say that again. Michael Jackson and his pet monkey. Done with like just marble and gold. Of course, he did not do these things himself. And in fact, I met Coons at one point while I was uh, picking up art. We were supposed to uh, pick one of his pieces up and move it. And, um, and he was there and... I remember his attitude was just totally cavalier. It's just like, you know, and he, he asked one of us, do you know someone who does, you know, a certain kind of fabrication of a certain uh, material? Because of course he, he just come up with these ideas, hand it to, he didn't sit there and sculpt or carve or anything. He just had someone else fabricate it. He took essentially Warhol's uh, factory technique. And then turned it into a whole nother level. There was another guy who we had a lot less respect for during that time, Mark Kostabi, who also did the same kinds of work. But what's interesting, this is one of the first pieces of his. It's called Rabbit. And guess, if you could, how much 
this piece sold for eventually. Look at it. How much would you buy it for? Uh, I don't believe it's actually the balloon it's supposed to be. That is to say, it's got to be more durable uh, characters in this. But essentially, he has reconstructed a kind of a balloon you'd get from someone on the street at a fair or a, you know, some sort of big event. Here's the answer. Are you ready? How much do you think? Guess. $91 million. I'll say it again. This imitation, totally kitschy imitation of a rabbit called Rabbit sold for $91 million. It's the most that a living artist has ever sold their work for. Where's the postmodernism? He's he's borrowing kitsch. <laughs> I mean, it's completely postmodern. Now, if you were here for how we got here, number five, where I talked about the rise of punk rock at the end of the 1970s, you would think that punk rock and new wave were going to be the, the trends that dominated the popular landscape of the 1980s. And in a way, you're right, but mostly you're wrong, especially with punk rock. Punk rock, well, Joan Jett, for instance, here she is uh, doing a piece uh, doing Bad Reputation, one of her classic pieces. This is from 1980. And she is essentially just doing punk rock. She would later become famous for just doing ro regular rock music. Hard rock, we'll call it. I don't give a damn about my reputation Punk and New Wave essentially had to be watered down. Punk, by the th time the Clash were finished, they totally just turned punk into a commercial artifact. Uh, but also, there were bands who were had kind of started off doing something like punk or New Wave music, who were, well, some of them mutated into what we call the New Romantics. Some of them ended up being just perfect fare for the Beast, which will come soon, called MTV. But other bands, like the following, here's Wall of Voodoo, singing their a pretty great song, Mexican Radio, but watch how they're singing it. I hear the talking of the DJ. Can't understand just what does he say. I'm on a Mexican radio. I'm on a Mexican And since we're watching Wawa Voodoo, let's watch uh, They Might Be Giants. Uh, each of these guys is from opposite sides of the coast. But noticed, what, again, how they are singing and performing. They want what they want, and I wish they would stop saying da 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 ding dang da 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 ding dang da 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 what do you see what you see is an extraordinarily ironic take in neither of these can the musicians be said to performing in a sincere manner they are are they but are they being comedians no i they're being funny yes but they're not trying to be comedians they're doing something very different than standard comedy they're not saying i'm doing this to make you laugh what they're saying is ain't it ironic and if you're watching you're in on the joke and what you're really watching here is the first kinds of signs of 
a new culture. And it's the culture that would come to dominate everything. It is the rise of a very ironic, knowing, cultural quoting, postmodern aesthetic. It's the rise of geek culture. It's the rise of cute culture. That is to say, there were geeky things and cute things before these songs, but there weren't the kinds of people to appreciate them. I often think about this when I overhear people having conversations. And in those conversations, it's the tone of the conversation. And I say to myself, do these people realize that no one, say before the 1980s, ever spoke in these kind of jokey, knowing tones uh, that are just interlarded with cultural quotes and such? It's in the 1980s that you get people who get into watching Gilligan's Island again. Why do they do that? Because they have videotapes that they can go back. But, it, you know, it's like, uh, I love Lucy. You know, you, you have these these cultural touchstones. Now, the people in the 80s are going back to the 1950s and to the 1960s, and they're looking at these things, and they're quoting. By the end of the 1980s, people would be talking, you know, knowingly about the Brady Bunch. If you don't haven't seen these uh, television shows, don't. Don't worry about it. I mean, they're just, they're just, you know, cultural detritus. But it's the f way people would talk about these things that would form the new aesthetic, the postmodern aesthetic. And again, I'm using this in cultural terms. I'm not trying to argue with Derrida or Lacan or any of these people at this point. I'm just simply saying, say what you want. This is postmodern culture. And it is vastly different than the culture of the 70s or the culture of the 60s or anything that came before it. However, we've been frozen in this kind of aesthetic ever since. And we're seeing it break now in different ways. One is towards fanaticism. That breaks postmodern because then many of those people, the people who are laughing at things then, wouldn't be laughing in the same way now. But that's where we're going. Oh yeah, let's talk about MTV. that I can't fix Cause I could do it in the mix And if your man gets you trouble You just move out on the double And you don't let it trouble your brain Set away go trouble down the drain Set away goes troubles down the drain Last night a DJ saved my life journey into sound. 
TV changed everything. And not for the better. But let's, it did do some good things. I don't have any problems with videos, rock videos, as a form. I do have a problem with the way music was starting to be consumed, though. And it went with other changes in the way films were being consumed as well, and the way culture in general was being consumed. How did MTV change music? The musicians now became familiar faces. Uh, there are stories of musicians like Tom Petty, who would be have been performing at the end of the 70s. No one really know, knew what he looked like. You'd go see him in a big auditorium or something, he'd be sitting over there. Maybe a few people would really pay attention. You could read about these people in music magazines or, you know, like Rolling Stone or the British had a lot of, like, Enemy and Melody Maker and these sorts of things. You know, Cream magazine. But basically, you'd never seen these people that often. You were not exposed to them. If you wanted to really see them, you had to go to the concert. Now, these videos were putting their faces everywhere. And so Tom Petty tells a story of how he's walking down the street, and they, he says, somebody comes up to him and says, where's your hat? Where's your mad uh, hatter's hat? And he's looking at them, well, what are you talking about? He'd done this video briefly where he put on a Mad Hatter's hat in one of his songs, and suddenly that caught on, and people are now walking up to him and saying, where's your hat? Well, that's what happens. This familiarity with faces becomes now uh, just absolutely multiplied. And we start looking at these people in very different ways. Music essentially becomes connected to visual packages. The biggest artists of the decade, Michael Jackson, Bruce Springsteen, Madonna, Prince, all had to package their music in certain ways. Some artists, like Madonna, sold herself as a package. That is to say, her music was secondary to the image, and she would, borrowing from David Bowie's uh, unwritten rules of, of changing your persona, which harken back to 
Bob Dylan's changing of his persona, which harkens back to uh, Frank Sinatra changing his persona more subtly, which harkens back to Harry Houdini going through three major career shifts during his lifetime. This sense of changing your identity became Madonna's sine qua non. That is to say, you couldn't imagine Madonna without her occasional shifts in image. That is who she was. And the music really was secondary. Now, you know, she has some nice songs. I think there was a moment when she was honest. One moment. She got close to being very honest. And it was during the Like a Prayer album which generated a certain amount of con controversy for the images. But if you compare that album to all of her other albums, you'll, you'll find this is the closest you get to the real Madonna. After that and before that, they are illusions. But she goes back to her natural brunette hair. She hasn't yet had her face s sculpted. <clears throat> she is just being herself, trying to deal with issues about her father, the breakup with her marriage with Sean Penn, these sorts of things. She is just being herself to the degree she can. I often say Madonna could never sell out because she never bought in. No one ever thought she was a great artist in, in the really genuine sense of art being meaningful production. This is as close as she got. <laughs> Madonna, other artists like Cyndi Lauper, Pat Benatar, had a real effect on the style of the times. Uh, in a sense, it's this new wave style mixed with a bit of black, what we now call urban style. I like how these words keep getting changed over the years for what the music is. Sophisticated R&B. Um, but... And and also, there was this effect in the movies. There were several dance movies in the middle of the 1980s. There was Footloose, uh, Staying Alive, which was a pretty bad sequel to Saturday Night Fever. And then, of course, there was Flashdance, which had a big effect, of course, on the way girls mostly looked. Take it away, Flashdance. Dance. <laughs> Of course, Flashdance was a complete fantasy. She was, what, a welder by day, <laughs> worked as an exotic dancer who never got nude by night and was trying to become a ballerina. <laughs> and, of course, she takes inspiration from hip-hop dancing. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I can't even begin to tell you how stupid all that is. However, it had a big effect on, again, the mindset of the way people looked and acted. Again, filled now with cultural quotes. Now, one could say, it's always been cultural quotes. And yeah, you're right. But the point is now, they're coming at a much faster clip. And they're coming more ironically, which is why Madonna could later be said to be a deconstruction of Marilyn Monroe. And that's not, it's not that Madonna was trying to be Marilyn Monroe. She wasn't trying to be a Marilyn Monroe type character. She was a deconstruction of Marilyn Monroe. And I remember having these conversations with people at the time. It's just like, why are you using the phrase deconstruct? It doesn't mean anything. It means take apart. Why don't you just say destruct? <laughs> you know, but I understand what it means now. That is to say, it has a very specific kind of meaning. When you deconstruct something, you're not simply taking it apart. You're taking it apart to reassemble it in any manner you see fit, ironically. Which is why I 
I always kind of react when people talk about deconstructing, you know, we're going to deconstruct the church. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. It's already really bad. <laughs> don't try to put it and build it back up in some new image with new uh, postmodern cultural quotations around it, <laughs> you know. But th again, that's that's too much of an issue to talk about. One artist who should have had more exposure because she was very visual during the time and yet didn't, was Kate Bush. She started off in the 1970s uh, being, uh, having a strangely ethereal voice singing about uh, the book Wuthering Heights. You have a Now, she tended to incorporate a lot of dance in her work because she was also a trained dancer and mime. Uh, but she started doing these really fascinating videos. I showed a little bit of uh, one of her clips at the end of my MTV montage. But uh, check out, this is the beginning of a piece called Army Dreamers. And just look at the way she's moving with the music. Now, I'm purposely not showing you a lot of those clips, and you should go look for them yourself. But the point is this. She did have one moderate hit in America, and that was uh, Running Up the Hill. Um, but the truth is, she never became that popular. She was much more popular in England. But I think it was because she was much more of an artist. And in fact, she is the first person, as a woman to start doing these shows where she would have the mic, uh, little mic attachment uh, come around so she was free. She would incorporate dance elements. She would move with the music. Sometimes she would play the piano. Much as everyone, Madonna, Britney Spears, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, have done these same kinds of uh, multi-dimensional, multi-media uh, performances since then. So she kind of set the template for that. But most people didn't really know that. But she's someone from this period who's really worth looking at. And I would say out of all the artists uh, from the 1980s who were in what I would call the surface level, she was the one who was most, like, or most really genuinely an artist and is worth going back to and paying attention to. Uh, there are others who are on the underground who are worth paying attention to as well, but we'll talk about them next week. And then this strange thing started in about, what was it, 83, 84. There was a group of people who got together in England and did this song, Do They Know It's Christmas? Which then led to We Are the World, which <clears throat> is probably number two in line for a globalist anthem after Imagine by John Lennon. Uh, let's try to stomach a couple seconds of We Are the World. Joe Bob Briggs, the great drive-in movie critic, once did a, uh, <laughs> a really sarcastic take uh, called We Are the Weird. He just wrote it all down, but he also made up lyrics for it. And this got him booted from, I think it was the Dallas Herald Tribune or whatever the name of the paper is. Uh, he's still sore about that to this day because they couldn't take the joke. Well, they wouldn't be the first people uh, uh, to not get the joke and they wouldn't be the last because essentially the people who would get squeamish and goody-goody about that sort of thing, for one thing, a lot of that money that was raised for that and for Live Aid never got anywhere near its intended victims. I mean, some of it did. But an awful lot got siphoned out, uh, out to the people who work at NGOs. That is to say, it went to the people who are working with the people who were trying to help things. When we 
amount of benefit concerts and benefit albums at this time. There was Live Aid, Farm Aid, uh, what was it? What was the comedy one? Uh, Comic Relief, that's it. Um, all of which were there to provide, you know, it's like important performers playing to expose themselves more, <laughs> literally, and to, to, uh, get the word out about donating to these charities, all of which were funded by people who were siphoning off money. You could never really get the money directly to the people. It's very difficult to do that. Um, my favorite of all the perf uh, performance and album uh, benefits during this time was uh, the Sun City project i'm not going to play sun city which was in south africa by it was put together by little steven uh bruce springsteen's good friend who also plays with the e street band little steven van zant and let me show you a clip of that Now, the thing about all of these, uh, We Are the World, Do They Know It's Christmas, Live Aid, Farm Aid, uh, Comic Relief, and the Sun City Project, is that they are all essentially forms of propaganda. That is to say, they aren't, I don't think they're genuine movements. They're things that someone comes up with and then goes out. You, you can argue with me about this, but I remember... I saw the Sun City, I bought the Sun City album, saw the video, and I thought, you know, it's pretty cool. You've got all, you know, out of all the performers in different uh, albums and benefit concerts, this these were the performers I thought were the coolest. So you had Bruce Springsteen, the Ramones, you know, uh, various rap acts, uh, just, you know, and it seems like Bob Dylan was always everywhere in one of these. And, and I'm a big Dylan fan. I'm going like, Bob, just don't worry about it. But, um, but I still felt it was propaganda. One of the things, and there was a lot of rising tide. This is where you first started to see this politically correct approach start to rise at the end of the 80s. You'd start to find students protesting their schools' investments in South Africa. Which I thought, okay, maybe there's something there. But what I didn't like was the attitude. And the attitude was, we are absolutely 100% right. Don't get in our way. And that attitude is what we are infested with now. And I remember thinking about that at the time. I'd already read Jacques Ellul's Propaganda. And I was starting to see if we only communicate with propaganda, we shall lose real communication. We were already beginning to lose it seriously by that time. One day, I was in a movie theater on 42nd Street. I was watching the film La Bamba, the Richie Valens story. Pretty good film. And I noticed, I mean, it was like 12 o'clock opening day, 12 noon opening day. Hardly anyone was in the theater, you know, in New York City. Most people have to wait till a little bit later in the day to go to the movies. And I noticed in the theater was Little Steven. So as I was leaving, I started up a conversation with him. We walked for about, I don't know, 15 blocks or so. And uh, I really liked his music at the time, although I'd noticed he'd taken a turn off into this, well, social justice area, social justice. It was starting to become an issue. And I started talking to him about the Sun City Project, and I started talking to him about the concept of propaganda. Oh, he, of course, defended himself. 
And one of the things he said was, well, what do you expect? How do you, how, what other way is there to communicate? Well, whatever there is, it's, you can't beat people over the head with we're right, you're wrong. There's other ways to communicate. And often I find that people set up these scenarios for various, um, they set up these scenarios for various projects and ideas and social justice goals. But they also make it that anyone who brings any sort of challenge to the idea is one of them. But he admitted it. He basically said, "I, you know, how else can you communicate? He admitted it was propaganda. But he also couldn't see another way out. And I realized, well, you know, since I'm thinking about these things, I have to try to think of a way to communicate without being a propagandist. And one of it is to leave it as an open discussion and not a closed discussion. Anything I say is my opinion. It's based on research, but hey, I'm one person. I can get a lot of facts wrong, but I can also get my emphasis wrong. So I don't mind people who challenge me because maybe they'll help me to get things right. I don't think it's a coincidence that around this time you have people like Tracy Chapman emerging, who is singing about social justice issues. And in a sense, what she's doing, she's going back to the early folk protest era and bringing that kind of emphasis on, on changing the world again through music. She plays very simple, stripped-down music. And what does she sing about? Let's give a listen. Don't you know they're talking about a revolution that sounds like a whisper? Revolution's just a whisper when she's singing. Well, I dare say it's now gone from a shout to a full-fledged scream. And that's the problem again. It's the kind of... Again, it's the kind of uh, situation we see where it's the attitude. I mean, what's funny to me is she's singing about revolution. Like, it's just going to happen. We need a revolution. Things must change. And yet the kind of revolution she's actually talking about is, well, it's got to have bloodshed attached to it. And that's where the problem comes in, is this romanticization. Uh, communism, Marxism has always had two strains. One, the romantic strain. We're going to change the world. And the other, the hard line, the cynical Communist Party member type, who basically says, okay, yeah, well, heads have to roll. So... That brings us up to the subject of rap music. Rap music at this point, we, we discussed uh, the rise of rap music in episode five. Rap music now has graduated from block parties to becoming something that's much more of an art form, a music form. And you can see this with someone like Run DMC. And that's the way it is, DMC. Bulls Run DMC is the first band to really change the format up, um, to, to add layers and textures to it that it no longer had. They had been doing the actual, um, you know, block party style. But then what happened was they ran into a record producer who basically said, well, why don't you mix it up with a bit of rock music? And that was kind of the beginning of this new thing. Eventually you would have Public Enemy, uh, the Beastie Boys, many other bands. MTV at first was really hesitant to get on board with any black acts. Then 
CBS Records threatened to pull out their entire musical roster if they didn't take Michael Jackson. So they took Michael Jackson. And of course, Thriller made MTV. You know, the, that album and, and the songs from it. Uh, also, Prince. But then, by the end of the decade, rap music was all over the place. And you started having commercial forms of rap music. People like MC Hammer, Vanilla Ice... But then something else was starting to come. For instance, I first noticed it in a, I think mean, it was 1988 film, uh, Colors. Let's watch this for a moment. Uh, listen to the lyrics. It starts off, well, just listen. I am a nightmare walking, psychopath talking. King of my jungle, just a gangster stalking. Living life like a firecracker, quick as my fuse. Been dead as a death, back the colors I choose. Red or blue, cause of blood, it just don't matter. Suckers die for your life when my shotgun scatters. Huh. The gangs of LA will never die. Just multiply colors. If you listen to the lyrics about being you know, a nightmare and a psychopath and a gangster, this is a new aesthetic, which will become much more important in the 1990s. So this is the hearkening of the new period coming. Let's talk about movies. Movies also were very, very important uh, during the 1980s, but not in the way they had been in the 1970s. In the 1970s, movies often contain these existentialist messages, particularly American movies, but also, of course, the European movies. But that started to really disappear in the early 80s. And what took its place, capturing the imagination, was genre movies, particularly science fiction and horror. <laughs> The 1980s saw the rise of what we call the blockbuster film. This huge spectacle of a film often done with, you know, elaborate special effects that dominated the box office statistics. Often these films were big summer hits. There's a bit of a prehistory of this in the 80s. You started with something like The Exorcist, and then you had Jaws was a big hit. Rocky was a huge uh, hit along these lines. Star Wars, of course, changed everything, followed by Close Encounters later that same year. And you also had things like The Empire Strikes Back, and you had uh, Alien, you had uh, Superman... And finally, Return of the Jedi. All of these set the template for what the blockbuster would be. Now, the earlier ones, like The Exorcist, Jaws, Rocky, those have nothing to do with the blockbuster cycle, as we now know it. I mean, they would try to make them that way, so that later Rocky films, for instance, are very different in tone from the early Rocky films. The first Rocky was very much a 70s film, not too different from Martin Scorsese's films in tone. And even its note of optimism at the end 
is only to a draw. It's it's a tie. It's not the you know overwhelming victory that would be reserved for all the Rocky films of the nineteen eighties. But it was Star Wars, of course, that really is the thing that changed everything. And I mentioned that before, so I'm not going to go back into it too much. But the 1980s set the template for the genre blockbuster. It's the thing that has worked as the central money-making component of the film industry ever since. See, in the 1970s, they'd lost their way. They didn't know what worked anymore. So you had huge hits from things like The Godfather. How did that get to be so big? Um, Apocalypse Now, which was 1979, late 79. Still, it, it eventually made its money back, but it was still a big spectacle, but not in the way we think of spectacles today. It was a very dark spectacle. There's also a shift in cinema culture. The film school generation, that is the generation of people who had been raised for the first time on the film school aesthetic of learning to watch movies and go back. And this was late 60s all the way through the 70s. In the 60s, you had a lot of the directors who would go on to be the great directors of the 70s coming out of these film schools with... This knowledge of all of these, I mean, people lined up. It was hard to imagine, but they lined up for foreign films with subtitles. I'm embarrassed for Americans today who say, I, I don't want to read films. It's just like, oh man, graduate and start getting something different into your system. Not that the foreign films today are on the level of those of the 1950s, 60s, or 70s, but nevertheless, uh, there is a world out there for those of you willing to explore it. There were magazines like Film Comment, uh, American Film, Film Quarterly, although Film Quarterly eventually became the first of these to have uh, been invaded by critical theory. And eventually I couldn't read them at all by, say, 1981 or 82. They were just like, it was impenetrable jargon by that time. Whereas Film Comment remained quite good up until the last... I don't know, five years or so they changed and then started becoming, they went from being moderately politically correct to totally politically correct. And so I even, after having a, a straight run of their magazines going from 1978 all the way up to 19, uh, to 2018, I just said, ah, oh, that's enough. They're, they're not getting better. They're, it's getting more of this, you know, it's just all, the topics you're supposed to hit. There's no more art. There's just social justice. I'm tired of it personally. But in the 1980s, you saw the rise of something very different. You saw the rise, for instance, in specialist magazines like Fangoria or Cinefix, which was this little square book practically that came out on a quarterly basis that showed you everything inside of how they made every big blockbuster there was. Also, Cine Fantastique was in that category. Uh, they were essentially how-to guides, which is really great if that's what you're looking for. That is to say, if you want to learn how to, uh, you know, apply latex paint or, you know, use con computer animated uh, uh, tracking, uh, these are, you know, fantastic things to read. If you care about the art of film as opposed to the craft of film, then no, they are not. And there started to be a real division between the people who cared about the art of cinema and the craft of movie making. So that after a while, the craft people essentially took over. And here was another problem. There was a change from more thoughtful literary, shall we call it, film criticism. People like Pauline Kael and Andrew Saras would write word after word after word describing films they had seen. But eventually you came to people like Siskel and Ebert, uh, who, looking back at them now, they're pretty good. But at the time, they were really a step down. They were the first TV film critics on uh, PBS to go popular nationwide. And they devised this. The thumbs up 
thumbs down. And I think a lot of us who really loved film in the early 80s said, this is really a step down. Because now it, it, it would just be simply like, and you'd see this on the movie posters, Siskel and Ebert, two thumbs up. That's not really a movie criticism. And eventually you start getting people like Leonard Malton writing these books with star ratings, you know, five stars, three and a half stars for me. I met a guy once who said, yeah, if, if it doesn't get uh, at least four stars from Leonard Malton, I don't want to watch it. To which I'd say, like, do you think he's the only person who has an opinion? <laughs> you know, it's just like, really? You think this guy knows everything about f film, that his his particular perspective should be good? No, I'd much rather read a really well thought out essay on the subject. But what really, 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 really damaged the appreciation of films and finally cut the heart out of all that film school nonsense was when they started publishing box office statistics, weekly box office scores. In 1990, no one hardly knew, I'm sorry, 1990, in 1980, no one hardly knew how much films made. We started to become aware of it throughout the 70s, very slowly. They'd say like, oh, you know, Star Wars is the new big money maker, and they would tell you how much it had made. But eventually you started getting these lists, and let's say like who, which film had, had uh, how many millions of, made how many millions of dollars in you know, national box office revenue. Well, what eventually happened was people started to equate box office revenue with quality, which is an extraordinarily dangerous thing. It's like saying the top hits of all time that have sold the most are the best music. And you could argue that, well, the Beatles sold a lot. They were pretty good. But you can't argue that with Britney Spears. So that's what's hap what happens, too, is you eventually move to the lowest common denominator. If someone figures out a way to sell something that more people will buy, that's what they will make. And that's what happened to cinema during the 1980s. <sighs> you started, essentially, so what happens is between the specialist fan magazines, you know, which got people salivating for the recent uh, fantasy and science fiction and uh, horror offerings, which created the first geeks, who were really an underground phenomena at the time, but would eventually become the dominant form of communication, uh, the dominant form of... I'm oh, sorry, some people are talking here. Okay. So the combination of the blockbusters, the failure of the 70s films, they really were too dark and did not provide an answer to most of the questions they posed, or, or even partial answers. And this new emphasis on the minutia of filmmaking through these specialist magazines, along with the box office statistics, created a new kind of film person, the kind who cared about how their film was doing, that is financially, you know, how, how many millions of dollars did Road Warrior take in? I, I remember thinking, like, come on, do better, because it was a better film than I felt in many other films. So who created the geeks and the stats? I think George Lucas gets special pride of place along with Steven Spielberg. And of course, the two of them worked on Raiders of the Lost Ark. E.T. was the biggest hit of the decade. But there were all the Star Wars films, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones movies. They were fun. They were good popcorn movies. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of depth to them. I mean, I've seen a lot of of badly spilt ink over them. But it essentially created this new thing of which Steven Spielberg is often present. Like you can see Steven Spielberg produce Gremlins. Look around here. Yeah, there's Steven Spielberg's name at the bottom of Back to the Future. Steven Spielberg was very smart in getting behind these things and finding a way to 
monetize <laughs> all of these products. Uh, this is Robert Zemeckis's, uh, who framed Roger Rabbit, who also became very smart about this whole project. Of course, the Star Trek films came back in. Eventually, the Star Trek would be on television. But they knew they had a captive audience. And they knew that they could essentially sell these things over and over and over again. So, like I said, Rocky starts off as a kind of a depressing 70s film, but ends up being this, well, another blockbuster that comes along. They don't spend quite as much on the uh, special effects as they do in the the sci-fi horror genre films. But, oh boy, did they spend a lot on the explosions. Rambo, again, First Blood, if you go watch it, it's pretty much a 70s film. It is not the big blockbuster. And then, of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger becomes a huge actor during this time. Huge in many ways. He was essentially a bodybuilder who becomes this guy. He very shrewdly figured out the system. And that is, he said, I am the special effect. My body is the special effect. Action is the special effect. And so he started getting these science fiction action films. Uh, the best of which during the 1980s, for my money, was Road Warrior, which I think George Miller had some genuine ideas here. And this one was produced down in uh, Australia. But alas, who did he run into? Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg got him to turn the third Road Warrior, a third Mad Max film, essentially into a Steven Spielberg-esque type of film. Eddie Murphy was also huge during this time, doing these uh, very, very you know, gun-heavy, crime-oriented films, Beverly Hills Cop, which really mixed, for the first time, crime with real bloodshed and comedy. So it was a criminal comedy, but, but with the emphasis on the comedy. Tom Cruise, by the end of the decade, emerges as one of the big actors. Huh. Funny he still is. He's like the Queen of England. He just never quits and never looks any younger. And then the film that probably deserves credit for really getting the superhero genre up and running. Uh, there was Superman at the uh, in 1979. But Tim Burton's 1989 Batman did the job. After this, there were Batman sequels. Eventually, there would be Marvel movies. And that leads us to the genre most dominant in our times, which would have to be the comic book superhero movie. Oh, we will get there. But not for a long time. I, don't, I, I can only talk about it so long before I start to get tired. Now, blockbuster-itis also affected another sphere, and that was the sphere of the Broadway musical. Cats, 1983, huge, 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 eternally running hit, which they unfortunately recently made a movie out of as one of the biggest bombs on earth, because evidently it doesn't translate. Amadeus was not a musical, although there was music involved because it was Mozart, but it was also a blockbuster for the stage on Broadway. There was this big Charles Dickens thing the Royal Shakespeare Company brought there, Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. It was two parts. You had to come two different times, and I believe it was over $100 for a ticket. And uh, this was a big thing. It was only seen by the real theater people in New York City and the other people who knew, ooh, this is a blockbuster. But it was a temporary blockbuster. It was just there for a short time. But it set a new standard for ticket prices, which now seem rather cheap. Le Cage à Faux was, uh, came from France, really, but was essentially re-jiggered for American audiences and became a huge hit in America. And the biggest hits of the season of the 80s were Les Miserables, and The Phantom of the Opera. And these were both legendary in their size and production. 
And it made it so that when you went to New York City, no matter how many years after the original productions had been produced, you had to see Les Mis and The Phantom. And later there would be uh, Miss Saigon and all sorts of other, I, I forbear to list them all, uh, blockbusters. But it set a tone. These blockbusters took in millions and millions and some billions of dollars uh, in box office revenue for these spectacles. And that's what they were. They were spectacles. They usually had, you know, the Phantom of the Opera has the huge chandelier effect. Uh, Cats had a, had a, had a big tire <laughs> raising up from the stage. Um, you know, the effects, engineering effects. But that's the world of the 1980s, the superficial world of the 1980s. So when people often look back, that, that is the world they remember. But what really happened in the 1980s is something very, very different. I have my own very personal connections to the things I'm talking about here because I was in New York City and I was at the center of so much of this activity. The other place to have been would have been Los Angeles, I would say. But that Los Angeles is always spread out. So unless you're really deep inside the film business, you wouldn't experience as much as I did in New York. But even then, you would only experience the film industry. Whereas being in New York, I got a chance to experience th this broad sense of this new blockbuster, superficial culture. And it really was, in many ways, very, very superficial. I mean, it was in the films, in the music. I remember lining up to see films like Raiders of the Lost Ark or... I don't know, any of the uh, uh, Terminator movies and such in New York City. I remember seeing on the the music change uh, from that more honest punk and new wave style music or even the early rap into this more superficial, the new romantic music, uh, the big hair music, the glam metal, all of these superficial types of music that became popular because they knew how to use video. I actually went to a horror and fantasy convention in Providence, Rhode Island. I think it was 1984 or 85. And that was fascinating because it gave me a real glimpse into a world which would become more dominant as we went. It was a world of the geeks. There were some things I learned there. Uh, I didn't spend a whole lot of time hobnobbing, although I was very interested in writing horror at the time. I, I met people, not there, but in other places, like, uh, you know, I met uh, Clive Barker, who wrote various horror books and such like that. But I'm not going to get into all of that. But I can say, I'm glad I didn't keep going to conventions. I think I went to one other comic book convention it held in the city, but I'm glad I didn't keep going, because... There's something strange that happens in those conventions where it kind of gives a benediction to this, this mode of escape. Rather than bringing it back to the world, it takes it away from the world and helps you to reinterpret the whole world through the lens of these things. Fortunately, cosplay was not a big thing yet in these conventions, which would have turned me off very seriously because I was always more interested in the serious side of horror uh, literature, the serious side of music, the serious side of film. Um, and I became very interested in comic books, which I'll talk to you more about later next time, because they were going through a mutation in the 1980s as well. But essentially, I see now that during the 1980s, there started to become the first hints of this romanticization of geek culture. When I partook in these things, there weren't a lot of us. I mean, there were a lot of people going to Star Trek movies or Star Wars movies or Steven Spielberg movies. Yeah, lots of people went to them. But, you know, when they walked out of the theater, you know what they did? They went home. They couldn't go online. They couldn't join a, a community. Very few of them, you know, very few people were Star Wars nerds. You know, I certainly wasn't a Star Wars nerd. I was interested in Star Wars as storytelling. I didn't think it was that deep as storytelling, but I was interested in it as Lucas telling stories. I was not interested in it in the way of, you know, arguing about what kind of costumes they were wearing. You know, I was uh, affected by the fact that the Mad Max series seemed to have died ignobly at the hands of 
both the Spielberg influence and the George Lucas influence with the influence of Joseph Campbell, which I consider Joseph Campbell's influence on films to be lethal because it makes people think, I'm writing the hero's story, the hero's journey. It's just like, oh, just stop and write a story and forget about that because you're not going to be able to do it. Just do your story. Make it good. Um, but essentially, like you can see something like in John Hughes' movie, uh, Sixteen Candles, and I didn't even get into talking about all the high school movies that started happening in the during that period, and that was certainly a superficial aspect of the 80s. We often look back and like, like, like The Breakfast Club somehow represented real high school life. <laughs> you know, in his movie, 16 Cam Candles, he has one guy called the geek, you know, and that's the first time the word geek was really, I think, popularly used to mean the kind of person who's into all of this genre stuff. Uh, whereas prior to that, all the way through the seventies, the geek was the guy who swallowed snakes and bit chicken heads off. He was a drunken carnival performer, the kind uh, mentioned by William Lindsay Gresham. And uh, yeah, so yeah. And that's what I, uh, when I ever I hear someone described or self-described as a geek, I still go back to, oh, what are you swallowing? So, but let's talk, let's shift gears. Uh, let's stay on the surface but a different kind of service. Let's go to politics for a bit. Let's talk about the end of the Cold War. Now, the most important thing about the 1980s by far was the end of the Cold War. And I mean really important. And ironically, it's the one thing that most people seem to forget about the 1980s when they go back with their nostalgia gear, their nostalgia VR in place. Ronald Reagan was seen as a hawk when he went into office. Mikhail Gorbachev came to power after a series of deaths and short-lived Soviet leaders the senile neo-Stalinist Leonid Brezhnev, his crony Yuri Andropov, and one more forgettable old-timer, Konstantin Chernyenko. Glasnos meant openness, and perestroika meant restructuring. These were two of the central pillars of Mikhail Gorbachev's tenure as the head Soviet leader. At the beginning of the 1980s, Ronald Reagan had referred to the Soviet Union as the evil empire. And there was a good case to be made that they were pretty in, pretty darn evil at that point. They were still kind of in their neo-Stalinist phase. Then things changed after Gorbachev. And when Reagan eventually ended up in the Soviet Union, he said, do you still, and he met just normal people. He said, do you still think this is the evil empire? And uh, he said, no, I don't think so. However, prior to that, he was asked, well, he was given an invitation to go to Berlin and talk. And in a famous speech behind the Berlin Wall, he told Gorbachev to tear the wall down. Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. From the Baltic South, those barriers cut across Germany in a gash of barbed wire, concrete, dog runs, and guard towers. Farther south, there may be no visible, no obvious wall, but there remain armed guards and checkpoints all the same. Still a restriction on the right to travel. Still an instrument to impose upon ordinary men and women the will of a totalitarian state. Yet it is here in Berlin where the wall emerges most clearly. Here, cutting across your city, where the news photo and the television screen have imprinted this brutal division of a continent upon the mind of the world. Standing before the Brandenburg Gate, Every man is a German separated from his fellow men. 
Every man is a Berliner forced to look upon a scar. President von Weizsäcker has said the German question is open as long as the Brandenburg Gate is closed. But today, today I say as long as this gate is closed, as long as this scar of a wall is permitted to stand, it is not the German question alone that remains open, but the question of freedom for all mankind. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. In 1986, in Reykjavik, Iceland, there was a summit meeting between Reagan and Gorbachev, and they became really close to settling many differences of uh, their nuclear arsenals. So close that they eventually did sign a treaty in 1987, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. And this was really, I would say, the impetus that led to the end of the Cold War. Things to remember. Solzhenitsyn had said late in the 70s, Essentially, that communism was already a shell. Everyone who lived within the communist world knew that it didn't really matter. It wasn't doing what it said it was supposed to do. In April of 1989, in Tbilisi, Georgia, where I'm living right now, there was actually an early push for more autonomy on the part of the Georgians. On April 9th, however, the Soviet forces massacred quite a few people. Let's watch a little bit of a very muddy-looking news story about this to give you a little idea. This is one of the first pushes towards an independent state within the Soviet Union. A period of non-stop public rallies began. The first took place on November 22nd, 1988, and was organized by the National Democratic Party. Merab Kustava, a dissident who had spent 10 years in the Gulag, was the hero of this gathering. Students staged hunger strikes to obtain an amendment to the Constitution which would allow Georgia to leave the USSR. chants the Lord's Prayer. Thank you. 
army charged with bully clubs, tear gas, and spades. The charge was led by special attack forces who were brought to Georgia for the express purpose of ending this movement with an exemplary strike. Casualties. 20 dead and 4,000 wounded. The investigative commission made it clear that the demonstrators had been unarmed and that the population had not been informed of the curfew. War gas was used. Despite the investigation, nobody was put on trial. Of course, from mid-April to the beginning of June, there was a push towards openness and freedom within communist China in Tiananmen Square. And at the beginning of June, there was a massacre of many people. We don't know how many exactly. So the communists in China did not go the same way as those in Eastern Europe and Russia would go. Many people thought this would be replicated time and time again in Eastern Europe as they tried to break free. People often think that the fall of the Berlin Wall was the end of the Cold War. It was not. The real pressures started in Poland. Let me show you some material to help you understand that. People think that it's the the East Germans and the, and the West Germans who caused communism to fall because it was so uh, visually fantastic to see the wall coming down in Berlin and so on. And, and they forget that the, 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 all the hard work had been done here. All of the communist governments in Poland tried to buy their way out of crisis after crisis. Each time things would get better for a while and then they just got worse again. People started to have less and less faith in the communists and at some point the people would reject them. This critical mass of opposition was bound to grow. Something had to happen in this kind of situation. You couldn't just walk into a shop, meat shop and buy whatever you wanted and as much as you wanted. Uh, meat was often rationed, you had ration cards. I mean, it's really uh, embarrassing to think of what uh, what life was like in those days, it was just so different. In Poland, the Russians faced a fresh challenge. The new pope, Karol Wojtyła, visited his homeland. He called on his flock to recapture control of their destiny. It broke down the barrier of fear. We saw that if we could stick together in solidarity, the authorities would have less power. The solidarity strike was born out of a unique alliance in a communist country between workers, intellectuals and a Catholic church that wasn't afraid to speak out. Polish intellectuals never believed in communism. Their cooperation with the workers proved a powerful mix when the country hit its latest crisis in the summer of 1980. What started as a protest against increased food prices developed into an attempt to rid Poland of a communist elite that had lost control and whose words couldn't be trusted. After the Second World War, we were handed over to communist Russia. It was never part of the Polish tradition to be a communist country, and we were always fighting it. Even Stalin said that communism suited Poland as well as a saddle fits a pig. It could never work. In the 1940s and 50s, we couldn't beat them with guns. In the 60s and 70s, we protested on the streets and our people were shot. So that's why we decided to try different tactics in the 80s. And they worked. Those tactics involved a sit-in at the Lenin shipyard in August when workers and intellectuals put together a set of 21 demands. These included the lowering of food prices, but also the right to organize their own free trade union. 
the government decided to negotiate with the strikers, but first it promised there would be no reprisals. Jak jest możliwe, żeby być, żeby ktoś traktował działaczy tutaj zebrał? Panie premierze, kiedy ja mam dziesiąt wystraszenia mnie już, że jak tylko wyjdę, to będzie to i to. Ja nie tylko... Proszę pana, to i mnie wtedy trzeba przepędzić. Nie możemy ulegać emocji. Nie ma takiej intencji. What began as an economic protest became a demand for sweeping political concessions. The government negotiators gave way to the workers' key demands. The workers were joined by intellectuals. Together they formed a new movement, Solidarity. Support spread throughout Poland. The USSR wasn't going to accept this threat to communist control. It sent troops to the borders of Poland, a clear threat that if its rulers didn't suppress solidarity, Moscow would. So, as the rest of the world looked on, Polish forces set about silencing the national opposition. On December 12th, Solidarity met to plan a nationwide strike. That night, the Polish government sent in the army. Solidarity's leaders were arrested. Solidarity was banned. President Jaruzelski declared martial law Obywatelki i obywatele, wielki jest ciężar odpowiedzialności, jaka spada na mnie w tym dramatycznym momencie polskiej historii. Obowiązkiem moim jest wziąć tę odpowiedzialność. Chodzi o przyszłość Polski. The attempt to crush solidarity was a traditional Soviet response to dissent. But when Gorbachev came to power, he changed the landscape of relations between the USSR and the Eastern Bloc. A man committed to glasnost and perestroika at home couldn't object to the people of Eastern Europe finding their own way in the world. Gorbachev said he'd no longer interfere in Eastern Europe. He advised Jaruzelski to sit down with solidarity and enlist its support. With the promise of Soviet backing removed, the Polish government had to talk to solidarity and finally agreed to free elections. The Polish people voted overwhelmingly for solidarity candidates. In panic, Jaruzelski phoned Gorbachev, who urged him to give way to the people. He did, and in August 1989, the new parliament elected a solidarity member as its first prime minister. This was the first non-communist government in the Soviet bloc since 1948. There were also changes in Hungary leading to openness and democracy there. In 1956, there had been the Hungarian Revolution, which was brutally suppressed by the Soviets in 19, early 1957. But in 1988, there was a restoration of some democratic voting measures in Hungary. On June 16, 1989, Imre Naj, the leader of the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, was exhumed and reinterred in a special ceremony. Many people felt in Hungary, this is now we are putting the communist period, we're beginning to put the communist period behind us. There was what was called the pan-European picnic as the Hungarians started to take down the barbed wire between Austria and Hungary. And what began to happen was that East Germans, who lived in a very repressive regime, started to escape. Officially in Hungary, the old communist system ended in October. Yeah, Leute, Leute. Yeah, yeah.
Es darf sich gehen. Es kommt so. Warte ein bisschen, warte. Jacke, Jacke, Ich hab's geschafft. Das sind bei Mama und Papa. Bei Oma und Opa sind hier. Ich hab's geschafft. Bei Oma und Opa. Rosa, mach doch eine andere Bitte. A whole situation was created by East Germans trying to flee to get to West Germany. It's a long story, well worth looking up and spending some time with. But it eventually led to the situation where a lot of pressure was put on Eric Honecker, the leader of East Berlin, who was now getting into a state of being kind of a doddering old man and was eventually replaced but it wasn't enough. And at a certain point, in order to alleviate pressures, the East German officials kind of accidentally let it slip during a meeting that the wall would be opened so that people could pass from Germany, uh, from West Berlin to East Berlin and East Berlin to West Berlin. But suddenly that news escaped. And before anything could be done, Hundreds and then thousands of people were pushing their way through the border gates. And suddenly it was that fall of the Berlin Wall. Let me give you a little bit of the clips from that time. No. A lot of history is being washed away with all of this. One of the extraordinary faces, one of the extraordinary people that made the history appeared right below the wall for a while today, just in front of the Brandenburg Gate. The former mayor of West Berlin, Willy Brandt. What a day. Yes, what goes through your mind and heart? Well, of course, I look back to all those years of hardship for the families even more than for the country as a whole. And it's moving to see families getting together again. My feeling is that we are very close to an end of the artificial division of Berlin. And I also believe we are close to the point where the parts of uh, Germany will um, come much closer together. This, of course, only within a reasonable European framework. With nightfall, the big party turned into a full-scale festival, a celebration of freedom and of unity. And as the night has worn on and it's gotten colder, tempers are getting a little frayed and tensions are on the rise. Now, just across the wall, look at the blue lights. 
The East German border police have moved in water cannon, and they have repeatedly said over the loudspeaker to the West Germans celebrating on the wall, which the East Germans consider their territory, the East Germans saying to them, don't throw any more firecrackers our way, and the loudspeaker calls attention to the presence of the water cannon. So many things happening in and around here, such a tumultuous history-making day. Now, many people thought, and, and again, there's this impression that the fall of the Berlin Wall was the end of the Soviet system. But it was not the first chink in the armor. We've already seen uh, Poland and Hungary fall uh, uh, prior to the Berlin Wall. Nor was it the last. And, uh, of course, we have the big, the big elephant in the room still, and that's the Soviet Union. But it is a highly symbolic moment. And watching people breaking apart the wall and, and such is a very important time. The next place that this almost like fever of freedom went to was the Czech Republic. And people started realizing that there had to be negotiations for some new democratic force. Believe me, the people in the Czech Republic didn't think, oh, yeah, or it wasn't the Czech Republic then, it was Czechoslovakia. The people in Czechoslovakia didn't think, oh, yeah, uh, the communists are going to roll over and play dead. Everyone had Tiananmen Square in their mind. Also, everyone in the Czech Republic remembered what happened when the last time they tried this in 1968, and things did not go very well. The entire uh, Soviet military apparatus rolled through Prague. And it, you know, people died. Uh, buildings were were shot at, and it was a period of repression. And they all had that in mind. However, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a sense maybe now. And indeed, Gorbachev was not purposely not interfering. And this is what gave everyone the boldness because they had what felt like a real assurance that the Soviets weren't going to roll in with the tanks. And he said, you need to deal with your own politics. So let's watch a little bit of the uh, Velvet Revolution in Prague. The whole now the focus is on Czechoslovakia. Now hundreds of thousands of Czechoslovaks are in the streets. They packed into Wenceslas Square. They jammed the side streets, and they were not just students and intellectuals. There were workers, too, and in large numbers. And in case the Communist Party and its government did not get the message from the mere sight of this many people, they drove it home with their chants. Resign, resign, they demanded. This protest movement may now be reaching a critical moment. A special session of the ruling Central Committee of the Communist Party meets tomorrow. It is empowered to make changes in the leadership. The most likely scapegoat is Milos Yakis, the party's general secretary. But the opposition group, the Civic Forum, wants at least five other Politburo members out. And the demonstrators are determined to throw them out, as they sang in their own version of a familiar American protest song. Czechoslovakia's leading dissident told the crowds in Wenceslas Square today, we will never return to the old system of totalitarian rule. Václav Havel is a playwright who has emerged as a central figure in the reform movement. After years of struggle against the communist state, years of harassment, arrest and imprisonment, Havel now believes they may be on the verge of victory. But the situation is still dangerous and unpredictable, Havel says. The protest movement is now too big to be controlled. Havel says the protest movement will settle for nothing less than the resignation of the hardline leadership of the communist government. Czechoslovakia today became the latest of the countries of Eastern Europe once held so tightly in the Soviet grip to throw off its hardline communist yoke. Bowing to pressure from the growing pro-democracy demonstrations throughout the country, Communist Party boss Milos Yakis and all the other members of the Czech Communist Politburo resigned. It was victory 
It was perhaps only one battle in a nonviolent war of liberation, but it was victory nonetheless, and they celebrated. The main opposition, the Civic Forum, got the word while holding a news conference. They popped open some champagne and toasted the news. Long live free Czechoslovakia. It was true people power that toppled the hardline communist leaders here, and it was surprisingly swift and easy. Five days of demonstrations involving several hundred thousand people in Wenceslas Square. And it was fitting that while the party leaders were deciding what to do, tonight's featured speaker at the demonstration was Alexander Dubček whose own reform movement 21 years ago had been brutally crushed by Soviet-led tanks. Dubček Nahrad, they chanted, Dubček to the castle. Prague Castle is the residence of the president. Now an aging, nostalgic symbol, Dubček from the balcony embraced the crowd. Despite today's astonishing events, the ouster of their hardline communist leaders you could see as they sang the national anthem, the people realize there's still a long way to go. So much has happened. Finally, there were other places uh, that had their issues, and one of those places where things were not so pretty was in Bucharest, Romania, where Nicolae Ceausescu was a really brutal dictator. He did not go peaceably. But here's a scene. He, he's talking in front of his obscenely large parliament building that he's built, parliament castle that he's built, which has destroyed the city, has moved thousands of people out of the city, r destroyed neighborhoods to build this monstrosity. And he's talking about it. And you can start to hear the people in the crowd, many of whom had been brought there as you know, dummies to fill in space, were starting to like say, this is it. And there was an overthrow of the government. At least a thousand or two people died in Romania in the struggle for power. I actually went to Romania in 2000, still very much a poor country, suffering from the effects of Ceausescu. And I saw that huge, ugly building and I realized how many neighborhoods he had to clear to make that thing. Well, finally, by 1991, it would be the turn of the Soviet Union after... Uh, protests and demonstrations in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Georgia. Georgia would be the first to declare in its independence as a separate nation. And the old Soviet hardliners were feeling like the Soviet Union is going to end unless we do something. They did exactly the wrong thing. They basically trapped Gorbachev in a vacation home and then... There was this. Muscovites take to the streets to fight the coup. Only a few short years before, under the Communist Party's dictatorship, any such action was unthinkable. Now they are gathering around the White House by the tens of thousands, ordinary Russians. They have tasted freedom and are unwilling to let it slip away. Yeltsin seizes the initiative. He will appeal directly to the people of Russia. 
His head of security, Korzhakov, is constantly at his side. The appeal was written and uh, Yeltsin says, I'm going to go out and read this myself. So we go outside, there's all these tanks and he climbs up on top of one of them. I am fully convinced that our countrymen will not let the coup leaders establish an anarchic and unlawful regime. We appeal to the army and to all patriots not to take part in this reactionary anti-government coup. The coup leaders respond to Yeltsin with even more armored vehicles and tanks. They are under the command of one of the Soviet Union's most able generals, Lebed. Yeltsin invites Lebed into the White House. Yeltsin asked me what was my mission. Funny thing was I didn't know myself. I couldn't answer directly. I replied in a general sort of way, my objective is to protect the White House. From whom? He I'm like a guard on duty from all who would trespass. A support for Yeltsin grows, the coup leaders plot to break the back of Russian resistance. The coup leaders hold a press conference. Gorbachev's vice president, Yanayev, tries to justify their actions. I can't agree that this is an anti-government coup. In due time, we'll publish a medical statement on Gorbachev's health. Isolated in Foros, under house arrest, but in perfectly good health, Gorbachev watches the press conference on TV with his family and personal aide, Chunayev. Gorbachev told me that uh, he didn't think they would succeed, but he was afraid that if they managed to hold on for one or two weeks, that people would get used to it. Gorbachev also decides to appeal to the nation. He makes a secret videotape. People around the world you are being misled about what is happening here. In fact, you are being deceived. I declare that any statement about my state of health is a lie. So, in fact, in this way, they have started an anti-constitutional coup based on a lie. In the streets, the situation is becoming increasingly tense as the night wears on. Everyone expects an imminent assault. Then suddenly, all hell breaks loose. Several armored vehicles try to pass through an access tunnel to the square in front of the White House. Mistaking this for the long-awaited attack, the volunteer defenders hurl Molotov cocktails at the armored cars. As they catch fire, the soldiers begin shooting. Three young people are killed. The deaths break Yasov's nerve. He orders his troops to stop. Then he calls his co-conspirator Kruchkov and tells him that he is out of the game. At 6 a.m. on the third day of the coup, tanks and troops begin to abandon their positions. The coup is unraveling. Gorbachev is coming to the end of the road. His one last hope of retaining power is to keep the former republics of the Soviet Union, including Yeltsin's Russia, in a confederation. But once again, he is foiled. Yeltsin has no use or need for Gorbachev. On Christmas Eve, 
the Soviet Union, the Red Empire ceases to exist. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Gorbachev announces his retirement. Because of the present situation, and because of the formation of a community of independent states, I have decided to resign my duties as president of the Soviet Union. My principles guide my decision. The trend to disintegration of the country has prevailed, and I cannot agree to it, nor can I accept it. I leave my office with concern, but I also have hope. I have faith in you, the people of Russia, in your spirit and in your wisdom. It is the end of an era of almost 75 years of oppression. And so the Soviet Union was over, and thus the Cold War was officially over. There was still Cuba, China, a few other places, North Korea. And yet there was no celebration in America. It really didn't affect America. And I have thought about this at the time. Uh, the younger folks in America that I was around during that time didn't really care. I mean, it was like, oh, great. But they didn't really think about it. I remember I was with a Russian friend of mine in New York City the weekend of the coup. It was a very important moment for us, very tense. But as I went and visited my punk rock friends, artist friends, other friends in New York City, and I saw them, most of them could care less. And I've thought about that ever since. Most people don't really think about the end of the Cold War. It's not a moment. It's not like the end of World War II where there was dancing in the streets. Part of this has to do with uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, who is probably the least likely out of all the presidents we've had to say, let's rejoice. This guy would have been like, well, I think we can say it's finally over. That's a good thing. Now, what about this Saddam in Iraq? Um, but yet this was a crucial moment for how we got here. Now, it really, of course, affected Europe. And it really affected all those countries that were behind the Iron Curtain, many of which I've been to and can attest just how important that was for them. In fact, it's very strange to them when Americans come there to this day when we'll say things like, so, how is it now that you're not part of the Soviet Union or the Iron Curtain anymore? And they look at them like, that was like a long time ago. Because Americans really don't have any understanding of time. What's funny is in America, we demonize fascists in our schools. And yet communists are always seen as these revolutionaries who didn't quite get it right. Otherwise, how could Tracy Chapman singing, you know, whispering a revolution, like this romantic dream, if her education had served her right? <laughs> you know, it didn't. Uh, there are different reasons for this. One was there was Marxism in the schools, particularly the uh, schools of higher learning. Many teachers had uh, tacit, implicit, explicit connections to Marxism. Um, then there was the fact that it faded away rather than that there was a moment of surrender. It's not like the Russians put down their things and said, okay, we surrender, no more Cold War. That never happened. Also the fact that it happened in Europe, not America. That is to say, so in other words, there was never uh, a moment when America said it's over. We just said, oh, okay, but I think the biggest factor is this. The culture war was already fully underway. Let me say that again. The biggest factor 
in why we didn't understand the end of the Cold War is because our culture war was already fully underway. The new enemies had been revealed. Who cared about the Soviet Union anymore? It wasn't cool. Not when you had Nirvana wailing about the postmodern fears of identity. Not when you had AIDS, abortion, the Middle East. Not, and eventually, Oklahoma and September 11th basically would wipe away the Soviet Union from active memory. Who cared about the secret police in Eastern Europe? Uh, I mean, and in places like uh, East Germany, they were really vicious. And who cared about the gulags? Who cared about the communist body count? When we had new travel opportunities in Prague and St. Petersburg, and you see all these like people talking about, like, yeah, Prague's the new place to go. You should go. Also, we have a great trading partner, partner in China. Hmm. Uh, but the educational system, having been weakened by the new health and safety fetishes and the new social justice fetishes, and higher education having been diluted embarrassingly by the Marxist rhetoric and had to now shift gears into the social justice ideologies, they just didn't take the time to teach anyone about the old Soviet Union. Which I think is a good chunk of the reason why we are where we are. Interestingly enough, if you look up certain things in Wikipedia, which is known for having fairly liberal watchdogs, left-leaning, we'll say, is a better word than liberal, you'll come across an Orwellian phrase like this to describe the millions upon people, eight, five to eight million people who died under Stalin's watch alone. This is the title. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It's called Excess Mortality in the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. That's why we don't understand what happened in the Soviet Union. If, if Wikipedia can write such... I mean, I'm sure you can go to the word Holocaust and find how many Jews died instantly. But, you know, up to 8 million people died just during this one period and... Possibly more, the article didn't seem particularly well-grounded, in fact. Excess mortality sounds like, yeah, we just had a little bit too much mortality going on. <laughs> not, you know, mass deaths under Stalin, not, but excess mortality. Well, who came up with that? I mean, it really sounds like an Orwellian Stalinist phrase. Essentially, the Soviet Union, the, the end of the Cold War, is as difficult to teach in our schools as is Reconstruction, another period. You see, because we won the Civil War, there's that period afterwards when you have carpetbaggers and people essentially just pushing things through and it all breaks down and you end up creating the KKK out of things like that. And who wants to discuss all of that? Uh, yeah, there are people who try to turn it into, you know, their deconstructional, a view of what happened and how it was essentially, you know, white supremacy and all this. But the truth is, if Abraham Lincoln had not been assassinated, it probably would have gone a lot smoother. And sadly, it didn't. Uh, sadly, the the desire for revenge hmm, uh, seemed to take place. And I really hope that that similar desire for revenge now, which is almost entirely in the propagandized mind as opposed to reality, I hope that doesn't come to the fore. <sighs> you know, what's funny is the Russians were starving in the 1990s, and very few people in America actually cared because we had won the Cold War, and after all, the Internet was just much too cool. I mean, it did have also, you could find Internet stories about, um, you know, how many cannibals there were in Russia. <sighs> So, that, but that's all another story. Um, well, eventually, however, our ignorance of what happened in the 1990s to Russia would come back and bite us 
in the ass in the name of Vladimir Putin. But that's another story altogether. So what were the 1980s? Were they superficial gloss or something else? Well, there was a lot of superficial gloss, and I think a lot of the superficial gloss was to escape the darkness and despair of the 1970s, which was the direct reflection of the changes in the 1960s, which was the psychic damage inflicted upon the children of the World War II era veterans. We're going to end with a song, a very superficial song by a very superficial singer, big hair and all, wearing bad 80s fashion, Laura Branigan. This was a song originally written and sung by an Italian singer who just went by the name of Raph, short no doubt for Raphael. And the song is called Self-Control. And let me play you a little bit of it. What I've done is I've found the lyrics of the song and I've superimposed it on the video. And I want you to pay attention to the lyrics. Okay, so far, pretty obvious, this person wants to live in the nightlife, uh, the clubs, the dancing, the uh, whatever goes on at night. Let's continue with the song. In the night, no control. Through the wall, something's breaking. Wearing white as you're walking down the street of my soul. And, you know, not particularly deep, a uh, little slight bit of poetry. But that's not what I'm trying to get to here. Although the wearing white is interesting because it's almost this ghostly image of a person. Although she doesn't do that in this film. You take my self-control. You got me living only for the night, which I think is really fascinating, the creation of these almost vampiric people. And I knew a lot of these people in New York City. Their whole world was for nightclubs. There was a really trashy 1980s film. If you want to see real superficial, trashy 1980s culture, go watch the movie uh, Modern Girls, which I think is kind of fascinating for being... Such an example of the trashy, superficial nature of the 1980s. But in The Morning Comes, the story's told, you take myself, you take my self-control. And what is this self-control? It's almost like it's an undoing of that search for the self, although that isn't going away. But what's taking it away? It's the night that's taking it away. It's the darkness. And in fact, the, the 80s is entirely a dark period. And even all of those, you know, how much, how many of those genre films are horror films? And how many of those science fiction films have darker themes if you just scratch a little bit below the surface? Another day goes by, I never stop myself to wonder why. You help me to forget 
to play my role. You take myself, my self-control. But here's the interesting thing. Another day goes by. And what's happening? The night, another night, another day goes by. And what's happening in the day? You're sleeping. And what's happening at night? You're living this weird, zombie-like, vampiric essence. But now we come to the central point. I I live among the creatures of the night. I haven't got the will to try to fight against a new tomorrow. So I guess I'll just believe it that tomorrow never comes. And to me, the line that really gets to me is this. I haven't got the will to fight against the new tomorrow. So I guess I'll just believe it, that tomorrow never comes. The new tomorrow. What was that new tomorrow? We're living in it. So in other words, what the 80s is, is a refusal. A refusal to live in the world it is a surrender to fun to cute things to technology to trashy music trashy culture and then there's that character that seems to be like death wearing the white mask in this a very eerie video as well as the song because on one hand, if you just listen to it, it's kind of like this dance song, you lose my self-control. And you just can imagine a person losing their self-control, dancing, having fun, drinking, taking drugs, going back with someone, having sex, and lose your self-control. But why are they doing it? Because they haven't got the courage to fight against the new tomorrow. They haven't got the courage to try to understand what in the hell is going on. And... That sense of the well, what Solzhenitsyn called the failure of courage is what this is all about. So that superficiality masks a darkness. Do you want to see the darkness? Come back next week because we're going to descend from the superficial gloss, that thing that everyone remembers. And has, oh yeah, the 80s, you know, the poofy shoulder pads and the big hair and, and the, you know, the, you know, George Michael and, and Freddie Mercury. Yeah, the 80s. And we're going to go down below the surface and see what was in the underground. There are a few decades that are this stark. The, the, the 50s was like this, but this is even much more so because the gloss of the 80s is completely illusory, even to the people living it. Whereas in the 50s, there were really people who believed that American dream. They believed they could be, you know, uh, the Cleavers, you know, with Leave it to Beaver. They believed they could be uh, part of My Three Sons. They, they believed that if we just played enough easy listing music, we could actually relax and maybe eventually get back to some kind of normality, whatever that was. But in the 80s, no one actually believes it. All that talk about money, no one actually believes it because everyone's still hustling for money and no one can get enough except for a few rich <laughs> Wall Street types. But underneath this surface was something, a bubbling cauldron of styles and images that are going to come bubbling up to the surface almost on cue as the 1990s begins. And so we will come back next week. <laughs> 
And we will, I don't know, next week. (laughs) That's optimistic. Let's say in a few weeks. And uh, we'll give you the conclusion to the 80s saga, part 8 of how we got here, the 80s, the underground. And uh, come, we're going digging on this one. Well, this is Burn for the Anadromist. Burn is the Anadromist. And I'm just going to say, we'll catch you then. And if you enjoy this video, well, that's probably the wrong word. Let's try it again. If you if you find my content worth listening to, share it. Uh, hit that like button. That does something. Uh, you know there's that bell icon. I never talk about that. But if you want to know when my next video comes out, if you hit the bell icon, evidently, well, what happens is you get a notification on your computer when Burn is doing something. So if you want to know that, you can do that. So, like, share, subscribe, hit the bell, and what else? Oh, yeah. Um, If you feel like contributing at all, I would really appreciate it. Uh, There are needs which I will describe in the near future. Big needs. But, let me just say this. If you want to get more extra material, I've got about 10 hours of stuff ready to go. Uh, Donation, $50 or more in one whack, or... $10 $10 or more as a monthly contribution through PayPal, link below. That would be helpful. Well, anyway, I'm out of here. I will see you soon. You know what? Things are going to get weird. As Leonard Cohen said, things are going to slide, slide in all directions. in his song, The Future. But don't let that worry you. What Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, once said is if he knew Jesus was coming back soon. Like the next day, what would he do? He said, plant a tree. Plant a tree. Do things that are going to last. Don't panic. Swim against the stream. A people without without history is not not redeemed redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments. moments.